Well, hi there. So today I've decided to break out my Tandy 1000 EX again and uh, do a little bit of playing around. In the past, I've done fixing videos and upgrade videos, but I haven't actually had a lot of time to play around with the software on this computer. So today I thought about how is the best way to get software onto this computer so I can use it. I don't have a hard drive, so of course I'm stuck with floppies, right? So you saw my last video about this computer. I replaced both the internal floppy drive and the external floppy drive with a three and a half inch. That helped bring the capacity of each drive to 720K from the original 360, so I could actually do a lot more with software. But I have to say, copying software onto 720K floppies from my uh, bench computer, which of course where you know everything is downloaded onto all the software, is a bit of a pain in the butt. It's very slow and everything. So I decided to do something about it. I had some comments on YouTube where people told me about using a floppy emulator. Here's one right here. This is the way it looks. When you order it, it comes with a little CD-ROM some jumpers and some screws. It's a normal three and a half inch uh, size. So this would fit in any any place that a three and a half inch floppy drive would fit. So here's the eBay listing for the floppy drive emulator I bought. A little under uh, $17. It's a 1.4 megabyte one. These are plentiful. You can find tons of them on eBay. Now one thing that's interesting is, yes, it's high density. And I know this computer does not support high density drives. It does support the high density three and a half inch in 720K mode but that's definitely half the data rate and I don't think this would actually work in this computer. There are others on there with 720K and there's 1.2 megabytes for five and a quarter inch and they cost substantially more like 30 or $40. But there's actually something you can do. You can order the cheap one like I did and you can upgrade the firmware. So I've removed the cover of the emulator and here it is. And right here is just a standard microcontroller. It's an ARM based one. And whatever firmware is on here is basically converting from a USB thumb drive, you know, these floppy drive images on it to, you know, the, pin, the, the signals that the floppy drive needs. Now what's cool is that someone has actually come up with new firmware to replace this crap firmware that's on here that does a lot more than you could originally do. So this very nice guy in France has come up with new um, STM32 firmware that goes on these cheap floppy emulators. He has a line of these emulators that are, are nice with big screens on them and little menus and stuff and do a lot more. Uh, that's his own line. You can also buy them from his website. So the new firmware for these emulators is the HXC2001 STM32 uh, firmwares. Um, it's not free. It costs uh, 10 euros. For each unit you upgrade, you have to use his upgrader software, which is an online tool. So just keep that in mind. So factor in the additional, you know, 10 or so dollars on top of the 16 or 17 dollars you're going to spend on this. But let me tell you, this is worth it. It's great to use this firmware, and this opens up these floppy emulators to be used in so many different ways in different computers, more than just a standard high density drive. Uh, if you go to HXC 2001. Oops, there it is, hxc2001.com. He will have the whole, you'll see the whole info about what this is and look for the firmware there. Putting this firmware onto this emulator adds a ton of extra functionality. Besides regular PC format, you get all the different sizes of disks, you get custom disk sizes, you get Amstrad compatibility, just get compatibility up the wazoo. Oh, sorry, you may have noticed that the white balance has changed and it actually looks better now. Uh, I have a new camera and I'm not quite used to it yet and I accidentally had the white balance set wrong. So I apologize for that weird bluish you know, cast everything had earlier. But anyhow, so here is the floppy emulator and I have the new firmware flash. As you can see, it says HXC uh, while there's no thumb drive connected. The other thing that's interesting is there's an extra LED inside here, right here. Don't really know what it was for. So what I did is I, I drilled an extra hole and I, I kind of folded that up. So on this one you can see that there's a red LED. It doesn't seem to do anything, so really I, I'm not quite sure about that. You don't really need to bother with that. Now I'm not going to show you how to flash this. Uh, the way it works is you use uh, UART, a serial UART, so basically a, a USB to 3.3 volt uh, TTL type serial converter. They're very cheap from eBay. You use his online software to do it. And um, you basically put this into bootloader mode by changing a couple jumpers on here and it will reflash the bootloader onto here and then you stick the thumb drive in and it will then load the firmware off that. Anyhow, I currently have this connected as you can see. This is my external enclosure. I have kind of taken the cover off and re removed everything. But I just have this connected where the floppy drive would be connected. You have a power connector here. You have the floppy drive connection. Um, you can actually change this for DS0 on these jumpers here. So if you want to put this internal to here without remaking the cable, like I did in my previous video, 
you can do that. But here it is. It's hooked up as an external drive, so it's the B drive on the Tandy. And I have a thumb drive full of stuff here. And let's stick this in. And what it does is it reads it, and then it goes to number three, which is the last thing I was using, and use these buttons to kind of go back and forth. Zero is the first image, and you can have as many as, I guess, 999 images on here. And you just sort of change it, and that's it. So now if I go to the B drive on the computer, and I type DIR, you'll see this green light light up. That's the floppy drive access light. Let me just do that right now. You see there, the light's lit up. It's very dim, unfortunately. I type DIR, and there it is lit up. Now you're asking how you get stuff on and off of this. Of course, he has good documentation on his website, but basically the gist of it is you use this software here called the HXC Floppy Emulator Software. This runs on Windows. And you can see right here next to it, I have the DOS uh, floppy disk file browser. So what happens is if you create an image, like say a 720K image, uh, as you can see right here, I have three and a half or 720K, then it has no files on it right now. But what happens is I can just drag and drop stuff right onto here, like a folder full of programs or files or whatever. And it actually puts it on the image and then you can save it right onto the thumb drive, you know, and the file name structure you can see here in the screenshot, it's like DS0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 002, whatever. It, the file numbers map exactly to the 0, 1, 2, 3 on here. So yeah, so, you know, that's great. It makes it really easy. This doesn't just use uh, image files. It can use like Amiga files, but for DOS, you have to create it in the HFE format, which is sort of the native format of what this uses. It's a file that's a lot bigger than the original floppy drive because it actually contains much more information about the sector mapping and very much like detail about how it all looks on the disk. If we were just stuck with 720k images, that would be helpful because I could still get stuff on and off of the Tandy really easily. But wouldn't it be great if we could have a little bit more storage space? When you go into here and you go to disk browser, at the top here it says file system type and the button, it's cut off here, but it says create disk image. And when you drop down this menu, this is what you get. And these are all the images you can create. So there's the 720K double-sided double density one I was using, but you can see there's all these other weird formats here. Lots of FAT12 stuff. FAT12 is obviously what this handy can use. But interesting is if you keep going down, you know, look at these higher capacity drive uh, images. So 1.75, but unfortunately it's double-sided and high density. And all the high density disk images types here, they require 500 kilobits a second. And the Tandy drive controller can only handle 250 kilobits a second. So that means we are limited to all the double density ones. So all of these double density ones are probably supported. But look at this. 2.5 megabyte double-sided double density FAT12. I mean, that's a substantial improvement over the 720K image. And imagine how many things I could copy onto there. If it worked, it would be fantastic. It would not run any faster than normal floppy disk because it's still at the same 250 kilobits per second. But capacity-wise, we're talking about a huge improvement. This is the one. Now, I have a star next to it because I'm not quite sure if it works or not, but it may well work. So you're wondering how exactly do you get 2.5 megabytes onto a single floppy drive? Well, the way it works is we're using an IBM MFM type disk, which is what standard floppies are. Uh, bit rate is uh, 25 kilobits per second, so that's right there. 300 RPM, standard RPM of the floppy drive. But right here is the special sauce. 255 tracks. So normal floppy disks, 720K variety, have 80. And a 360K, which is what's original on this computer, has 40. So obviously 360 times 2 from 40 to 80 equals 720K. And that's why this computer can address it. But what if we bump it up to 255? And the next thing is sectors per track. Now 9 is a normal size, like a typical floppy disk has 9. But if we bump that up to 10, you can actually fit an extra sector in there. That's what enables us to get up to the 2.5 megabytes. All right, here we are with the Tandy 1000. I have it all connected up. Uh, the thumb drive, I'm on the third image, which is one of the 2.5 meg ones, and you can see here I'm running check disk. And this is 2.5 million or more than that bytes available on this disk, so yes, we're getting the 2.5 megs, it's great. As a side note, I am running uh, DOS 6.22 on the Tandy right now. I don't know if this works fine with the lower versions of DOS, it may well. I just upgraded to the newest version anyway, it's just for, you know, extra commands like DOS key and stuff. But you know what? While this seems to be working, if I type DIR, you'll see I have a bunch of stuff copied on here, which I copied on from the PC. But there's an issue. We're going to go to T-Paint, which is Turbo Paint. And look what happens when I run it. 
So it tries accessing it for a little while here, and then we get sector not found. So I have a feeling, you know, the the way the BIOS is or whatever, it just doesn't seem to like handling uh, dot drives that have, you know, maybe over 80 tracks or at least up to 255. Nothing seems to work properly on here. I found a workaround. After Googling around, I found this really interesting program called nFormat, and it's essentially a low-level format application. You can customize these formats here, and you can see there's several different ones listed here, and you can actually edit every parameter when you're formatting it. Now, using this tool, on the other hand, you can actually format any disk any size you want, you know, as long as the controller allows you to do it. I don't actually need to format these drives because this is actually formatted already with the software, but this came with a little handy utility. Now included with the zip file with n format were these two things, biospatch.sys or biosptc and fastdv.com. And reading through the documentation that was included, it said that this was required on most XTs to patch the BIOS routines to allow it to handle the larger number of tracks and sectors. And then fastdv alters the seek setting speed as it steps the head. There's a delay in between each step to allow the physical head to move. And this maxes out the setting to as fast as it will go. Now I'll go ahead and add this to the config sys and I did some testing with FastDV and this does seem to speed up disk access quite a bit. It actually changes the noise of the internal drive and I'm assuming on this external emulator it doesn't matter. It can go as fast as possible. So emulate it anyways. Uh, and let's uh, reboot and see how these work when they're running. Okay, so I've rebooted here with those stuff running and it doesn't even show anything as it loads up and I really don't think it actually uses up any space in memory. I think it's just a quick patch. I'm also running something called Fast Graph. I found this in one of the Tandy archives. It's supposed to speed up the BIOS graphics routines. Who knows if that really works or not. But let's go to B. We're still on 3, which is the uh, larger one. So here we go, like T-Paint, as for instance, T-Paint. Let's see if T-Paint works now. This is the same exact image, 2.5 megabytes. I haven't done anything. And you can see the green light is there, is active. Now this is flashing, it always flashes. So if you have a thumb drive that flashes when it's accessed, it will be a bit annoying like this. Oh look, it totally works. That little BIOS patch is what you need on the Tandy at least, and potentially on other things as well to get it working with the 2.5 megabyte uh, images. Yeah, how cool is that? I mean, thumbs up, 2.5 megabytes per image. That opens up a lot of possibilities to running more stuff on this computer more easily. All right, so let's uh, run a few things now that I have all this working, the large format. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna run is something called Pix100F or 1000F. This was a program that has been written in basic and he actually emailed me or sent me a YouTube message asking me to run his old program on my Tandy 1000. He hasn't been able to see this run on native hardware in a really long time. Ooh, yeah, there it is, Tom's program, Pix 1000. Very fancy. All right, um, uh, how do I, oh, look at that, I hit enter. Okay, wow, I'm very confused. Um, I have a joystick connected, but that doesn't seem to do anything. The arrows don't seem to do anything. We got this flashing kind of very flickery cursor here. I'm just pushing keys. Okay, so it moves. Uh, Tom, you might have to give me some info on how to use your program. I'm kind of making that thing move around by pushing keys, but I really don't know. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, Control C. Hmm, control break. Well, <laughs> breaking 50,000, 50, huh? Tom, I gotta give you props. This looks relatively complicated. Uh, there's a lot of go-tos and look at all these line numbers very close together. It means he did a lot of debugging. I'd be curious to know how long this took you to write, Tom. Okay, I moved on to Arkanoid here. Let's give this a test. Tandy video, uh, we can use the mouse because I have the drivers installed. Ooh, there it is. I don't think this has any Tandy sound though. But it's definitely using the Tandy uh, 16 color graphics there, which is equivalent. Oh yeah, that's definitely using Tandy sound actually. Nice! Yep, multi-channel, well, the whole three-channel sound. I mean, I used to play this on my Apple II GS, and it, of course, it has 16 colors as well, but it has user-definable 16 colors because it's the analog RGB as opposed to TTL, so this is stuck with these exact colors. So, you know, it's not great, but 
see. Oh. Yeah, performance is decent. Well, considering uh, this computer's next T-Class machine, this plays quite nicely. I'm thumbs up with for Arkanoid on the Tandy. All right, so I'm trying Defender of the Crown here, but this definitely is running in CGA with PC sound, not Tandy support, so looks pretty craptastic. I'm not loving this. Yeah, so this is, uh, CGA graphics is just quite poor, <laughs> so this just is not great. And PC sound, when you're used to Tandy sound, it's not great. Let's, I'm gonna call it quits for that game. Okay, so I'm trying out Marble Madness here. This is a weird start to it. Oh. There we go, it's some kind of a crack intro, a crack intro, <laughs> but in fantastic CGA graphics. Don't forget to call the Anarchy Burger 2 at area code 312, which is what, Chicago, Illinois? 343-9753. Well, who, who was this person? Do you think he's still around? Maybe he'll watch this video and he'll tell me that it was him who cracked this game. Alright, so here we have Marble Madness, and this was a game I actually really liked. I used to play this on my Apple IIGS as well. Oh, hey, not bad. Oh, yeah, so it works. And this is, even though it doesn't seem to be using very many colors, it's definitely Tandy graphics because, see, you know, we've only got red, red, white, black, and kind of a bluish color. But that is not, uh, there is no Tandy. Oh, sorry about this. There is no, well. I was like, whoa, whoa. There is no Tandy palette that looks like this, so, um... Okay, the flashing is the camera. Okay, that's a bit better. Yeah, so, this is using Tandy 3 voice sound, and it's using my Tandy joystick. Ah, oh, the black ball is so annoying! And as you can see, we've got four colors, but they are not the normal Tandy, or they are not the normal CGA ugly colors. Ugh. Boy, I'm rusty at this game. I actually finished this game back in the day. Look at that, he beat me, he bashes me right off. I got a bonus though for... Oh man. This is a pretty tough game, I have to say. But... Final game we're gonna do tonight is Leisure Suit Larry. This game supposedly has some racy subject matter that you're supposed to be, you know, over 18. Sorry, that's the best I can do to make this thing not flash horribly. But this is Leisure Suit Larry, yeah, it's cute. It's using Tandy graphics, it's using Tandy sound. I think if I hit enter here, it's gonna ask us questions about age to verify if we can get into, you know, play the game. Warning, Leisure Suit Larry in the land of lounge lizards contains some elements of plot which may not be considered appropriate for some children. Oh no! How old am I? I'm 98. Warning, this game may be hazardous to those with heart conditions. Okay, if we're 98, we have to, uh, <laughs> marry. Okay. Look at this. A Macintosh is a kind of Apple with Apple case, uppercase A, or Apple with lowercase A, an article of clothing, or all of the above. I'm going to say D. Correct. Michael Doonesbury founded. I have no idea. <laughs> Walton Puddle. I'm just going to say B because I don't know what that is. There, look at that, I was correct. Richard Nixon <laughs> was a plumber's friend. How about a president? Correct. Whips, chains, and handcuffs are kinky. Used by the police departments. Uh, not whips. Usually in text adventures, I'm just going to say kinky. Correct. Look at that. So far so good. Now the final question. Are we going to make it? I have to say, um, I've tried this recently on, I think, my 286. And I was not able to get in. It, it didn't work. 
How many programmers does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. It's a hardware problem. None. Programmers can't fit in light bulbs. 100. One to hold the bulb and 99 to debug the house. None so far, but they'll get to it real soon. I'm just going to say C. I have no idea. Look at that. That was the right answer. Wow, there we go. Leisure Suit Larry. Score 0 of 22. Sound is on. Hello? Oh! Nah, Tandy graphics are way better than CGA graphics ever were. Look, I'm typing hello. Hi. Is this like artificial intelligence? I'm gonna say R. Are you Siri? What's R? <laughs> Look, I can use the arrow keys to walk around. Oh, he walks very, very slowly. And remember, my Tandy has the V20 processor upgrade. And yet, this is torturously slow. So I'm not quite sure that this game is necessarily designed to run on an XT class machine. I think it came out in the late 80s and really by by that point you know 286 was pretty common and pretty standard. This would be loaded onto a hard drive because right now it's accessing the floppy drive. Oh no! Fight! Get out of here! I mean okay so I walk very slowly but the guy who just came and hit me walked very quickly so well, there we go. So yes, Tandy 1000 is totally compatible with 2.5 megabyte disks using one of these floppy emulators once you load the HXC firmware onto it. You can most likely install the same firmware on one of these and use this in any of your XTs. Just don't forget to get the end format and put that BIOS patch in. I will include links to everything you need here in the comments, uh, including a link to download the end format. Um, if for some reason it disappears off the internet, just let me know. I saved a copy of it, so I should be able to put that up somewhere to share. But right now, I'm going to link to the original source where I downloaded it. But yeah, there we go. So uh, if you thought this was useful or interesting in any way, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Um, you know, you can subscribe for more content. And uh, basically, thanks for watching. Have a good night. Bye.